Last night in Brussels, I set out Britain's new settlement with the European Union. This morning, I've just chaired a meeting of the Cabinet in which I updated them on the special status we have secured for Britain. And the Cabinet agreed that the government's position will be to recommend that Britain remains in a reformed European Union. Now I want to speak directly to the British people to explain why. We are approaching one of the biggest decisions this country will face in our lifetimes, whether to remain in a reformed European Union or to leave. The choice goes to the heart of the kind of country we want to be and the future that we want for our children. This is about how we trade with neighboring countries to create jobs, prosperity, and financial security for our families. And it's about how we cooperate to keep our people safe and our country strong. I know there will be many passionate arguments over the months ahead, and individual cabinet ministers will have the freedom to campaign in a personal capacity as they wish. But my responsibility as Prime Minister is to speak plainly about what I believe is right for our country. I do not love Brussels, I love Britain. I'm the first to say that there are still many ways in which Europe needs to improve and that the task of reforming Europe does not end with yesterday's agreement. And I will never say that our country couldn't survive outside Europe. We are Great Britain. We can achieve great things. That is not the question in this referendum. The question is, will we be safer, stronger and better off working together in a reformed Europe or out on our own? The shock to our economy after leaving Europe would tip the country into recession. This could be, for the first time in history, a recession brought on ourselves. As I stand here in B&Q, it would be a DIY recession. And it really matters to everyone. Someone actually asked in this debate the other day, you know, that's the economic case. What about the moral case? But don't they realize the economic case is the moral case? <laughs> the moral case for keeping parents in work, firms in business, the pound in health, Britain in credit, the moral case for providing economic opportunity rather than unemployment for the next generation. Where is the morality in putting any of that at risk for some unknown end? Within two years, at least half a million jobs will be lost. That's 80,000 jobs in the Midlands, over 100,000 jobs across the North, over 40,000 in Scotland, over 20,000 in Wales, almost 15,000 jobs in Northern Ireland. In London, over 70,000 jobs will be lost. Here, across the South, almost 120,000 jobs will go. And that's the lower end of the estimates. Across Britain, as many as 820,000 jobs could be lost. The people of Britain want to know the facts before they vote on the 23rd of June. The Treasury analysis steps away from the rhetoric and sets out the facts. Britain would be permanently poorer if we left the European Union. Under any alternative, we'd trade less, we'd do less business, there would be less investment, and the price would be paid by British families. Wages would be lower, prices would be higher, and that means that Britain would be poorer by £4,300 per household. That is £4,300 worse off every year. A bill paid year after year by the working people of Britain. Today's inflation report was about just one thing, Brexit. Bank of England Governor Mark Carney was unambiguous. A vote to leave the European Union could cost jobs, raise prices, see the pound fall sharply and even lead to a recession. He joins a host of other key economic commentators in warning that this would be a self-inflicted blow to the British economy. The majority of economic analysis that has been conducted agree that a vote to depart the EU would be costly in the long run, even after this uncertainty has been resolved. And in the short term, there is also a risk of an adverse market reaction to a leave vote the implications of which could be particularly severe 
She didn't have much detail, but did say British national output would fall under Brexit by 1.5% at best, 9.5% at worst. With this referendum about whether we stay in or whether we leave a reformed European Union, it's a vote and a decision that we will be living with probably for the rest of our lifetime. So it's absolutely vital we really think hard about all of the issues and we make a clear and uh, sensible decision. And so I make no apology for the fact that we have, you know, so we are sending to every household in the country this leaflet which sets out what the government's view is and why we come to that view. We're not neutral in this. We think it would be a bad decision to leave. We think it would be bad for our economy, bad for jobs, bad for investment, bad for families' finances. We think it would be bad for universities. We're not neutral. So we've made a clear stance in this leaflet, which I hope everyone will get a copy of uh, at their home. Even though the official campaigning period has yet to begin, and that's why the government has been able to produce this uh, leaflet that I've got here with me. Now, I've just printed this off the computer. When it drops through the households of every single person uh, in the UK over the next couple of weeks, it's going to look a lot glossier than this. Uh, this is the front cover, though. Uh, it's only, as you can see, sort of aimed at people who genuinely want to know more about EU membership. There's nothing about this front cover that really uh, pulls you in. And it is quite a sober and serious document. Documents, 14 pages, uh, convincing you that you should vote to stay in the EU. It is, of course, interspersed with uh, what will be glossy colour photographs, uh, people just going about their everyday business, doing your shopping, uh, taking your children to the park, just to convince you that the government really knows what it is that you're about, um, and to keep you interested, of course. And there's loads on here, uh, pretty much what you would expect. Uh, a lot on the economy, uh, a lot about the uh, perceived risk of leaving the European Union, the economic uncertainty certainty that the government thinks it would bring about uh, and of course loads on security and migration. Now it looks pretty simple, pretty simple document. Uh, it's going to be printed out in 27 million copies uh, and it's going to have a total cost of £9.3 million including an accompanying website. The controversial thing, who is footing the bill for this leaflet? Well it's the taxpayer of course. Last night's vote leaves a cloud of uncertainty hanging over our economy, and our most urgent task in this House is to lift that uncertainty. But the economy itself is remarkably robust. It has grown for nine consecutive years with the longest unbroken quarterly growth run of any G7 economy, and is forecast to continue growing in each of the next five years. An economy that has created over 3.5 million net new jobs under Conservative-led government yeah, 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 yeah. that has almost halved Labour's shocking legacy of youth unemployment, <laughs> that has seen female participation in the workforce increase to record levels, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that is now delivering the fastest rate of wage growth in over a decade. An economy that has defied expectations and will provide the solid foundation that Britain needs to seize the opportunities that the future offers. The spring statement paints a more upbeat picture of the UK economy than recent Brexit news might suggest. Agreed, the figures show a slowdown in UK growth in 2019, but this is in a world where growth is slowing in most major industrialised economies. Indeed, on these numbers, UK growth will probably be slightly better than German growth this year, and of course Germany in recent years has been Europe's star performer. Stronger than expected tax revenues mean that government borrowing is much lower than the market expected. That means that the Chancellor has maybe £26 billion of dry powder to increase public expenditure in the next few years and still meet his debt target. And these forecasts assume that a long squeeze on the consumer is over. They are forecasting another six years in which real incomes rise. Since before the EU referendum, there have been fears that hiring would falter as employers exercise caution ahead of a period of uncertainty. 
But a study by the recruitment firm Reed has found that after a brief slowdown in job advertising in June, it picked up in October to above its pre-referendum mark. The sectors that saw the biggest rise in hiring in 2016 included purchasing, security and safety and health and medicine. With the most new jobs on offer was Northern Ireland, which was up by more than 50%. The capital was at the lower end of the scale, rising by just 2.2%. But the only part of the country where job offers actually fell was the South East, excluding London. Oh, James Reed is the company's chairman, joins me now. James, before we get on to that, what did you make of those Robert Goodwill comments? I mean, this levy will have really got employers panicking, won't it? Yeah, not much. I mean, it was another idea that was floated and shot down on the same day, as you said. And, and I mean, it, it didn't make much sense, and, and hopefully we've seen the back of it. Yeah, so very encouraging uh, s statistics from you today, this survey. What, what is, what's behind it? Yeah, well, it's very interesting. I mean, since the beginning of January, that was last year's data that you, you just reported on. Since the beginning of January, we've had 86,000 new jobs on our website, and that's 18% up on the same time last year. So that pace of accelerating uh, employment prospects is, is, is increasing. Can employers actually fill these roles? Is, is there a bit of a, is this tightness in the labour market going to push up wages? Because most people expect inflation to overtake wages this year. Yeah, that's a danger. <laughs> and so I think that the, the fact that there are, more, there are more employers looking is potentially good for wages. Wages have been stuck for a long time. I mean, it's in everyone's interest that wages go up. So I'm hopeful that wages will go up this year if this trend continues. Prime Minister, the Commonwealth heads of government are in London this week and uh, to discuss relations and for Britain, trade is high on the agenda. What's on offer from Canada? Well, we're looking, of course, to have a seamless transition as we uh, go from the CETA deal that we just signed with the entire European Union, including Great Britain, obviously, to uh, having a version of CETA that is standalone that will flip over the day after Brexit. So we're you know, very happy with uh, trade with Britain. Uh, it's our largest trading partner in, in, uh, in the European Union, uh, and we'll look to uh, make sure there's predictability and continuity. Previously, you've advocated uh, for Brexit. Uh, Britain now seems to be teetering on the brink of constitutional collapse this week. Are you having second thoughts? Well, you know, if I were a private citizen again, I'd have a lot of commentary on it. I'll just uh, say this. The president's been clear. He wants a resolution of this issue that allows the United States and Britain to come to trade deals again. He sees huge opportunity. Uh, if Britain's status can be resolved. And I think the point he's made that I would stress is people of Britain have voted. When is the political class going to give effect to that vote? Do you think a, a trade deal is still in the offing between the U.S. and the U.K.? We are ready to go. We are ready to go. Trade Minister Liam Fox would be welcome here. Any member of the government would be welcome here. We can do these deals quickly. We're, we're ready to go. We want to partner with a newly independent Britain. Britain's relationship with China is complicated by history. This is the remains of Beijing's old summer palace, ransacked and looted by British and French troops more than 150 years ago. Chinese people are taught not to forget it. As she embarks on a three-day tour of China, Theresa May will have larger concerns than historic grievances. She's here on a mission to increase British trade with China. That need is growing quickly following Britain's decision to leave the European Union. $13 billion worth of trade deals were signed on Wednesday. Significantly, the Prime Minister said in spite of her earlier reported reservations, Britain would now cooperate with China on its One Belt, One Road initiative, President Xi Jinping's pet project. What's your main focus of this trip? What would be a win for you here in China? Well, we're talking about trade and investment together. Um, too often people will disaggregate them and talk just about trade. Clearly our trade with uh, China is worth about £60 billion pounds, and we saw a big rise in UK exports to China last year, about 32% increase 
one of our biggest in the globe. But we're also interested in how we get that investment relationship right. One of the strongest relationships the UK has in the world is with the United States because it's not just about our trade, it's the amount of money we've got invested in one another's economies, the biggest uh, relationship of that sort that we have. So we've been looking at China not just as an inward investor to the UK, but how we can get better partnership and collaboration in a whole range of areas, tech being one of the ones that we are focusing on at the present time.